really make that distinction, you cannot be trapped another day. You're not a prisoner another day, and you're actually out of it. Do you understand? To come out of something is not to run away from the country. You can't come out of something that way. You're coming out of it by not living by its doctrine. Hmm? Yeah, that works. Satan has his ways, and they're embedded in everything. Satan works by force. God doesn't do anything by force. He doesn't. God creates a way, and one may choose or not. Somebody says there are commercials now in Christians wealth-making. Yes, they are. Because in truth, in truth, in truth, let's go ahead and face it. When you don't have spiritual evidence in your life, when you really don't believe in the supernatural powers of the most high, you don't, you don't really live your life by the doctrine of Jesus Christ. You have no assurances. And the only way to get through in this world for them is to have money as their answer. So they have to have money as their answer. And, and let's face it, without money, guess what? Guess what happens if you don't have money? Anybody? If you don't have money, what can you do in this world? You can't do anything. Which is why, which is why, which is why you guys are able to have money to do things. But you have to understand what that money is. That money is a tool. That's all. That money is a tool. That's it. You guys see that? A tool. A tool. It is the world that teaches you philosophies to try to make you a part of this world and to be stuck there spiritually. The world has been doing that for a long time. And to be honest with you, they've been winning over a lot of people. Because I can tell you right now, people cannot part from their stuff. They can't. In order for people to be spiritually firm, we're going to have to come out of these things of the world. The mindset, it begins right here in your mind. It does. Because that separation is coming. And those who have chosen against Christ, there are things out there that know exactly where you stand. Do you know that every demonic entity knows if you truly believe or not? And when they're given permission to touch flesh, what do you think is going to happen to those who really, who really don't believe? If people are playing, they're going to be ripped to shreds. They will not be embraced. They're going to become puppy chow. People don't think that way because everything is quickly named. And all subjects that can answer any important questions are put in the area of mystique. And even the government plays their role in perpetuating deceit, like UFOs. Why won't anybody come out clearly and say exactly what they are versus what they're not? Why? What's the big deal? I'll tell you why. They're utilizing them. They can't come out and say it. They can't do that. That type of deceit can be utilized. It can be utilized to make people come up with these ideas that people will believe. Movies that people will go watch. That's entertainment. And while you're watching that entertaining movie, they're reinforcing doctrine within you. And that doctrine is hard to separate from. How many think they can break away from any doctrine at any time? No big deal. Most people cannot. Some people are not even aware that they exercise worldly doctrines a lot. But I'm telling you, a move is coming. And all those people who play, they're going to hope that they were never born. They will. 
They'll wish and regret the day that they were born, but they'll wish they were never born. And that's why they're alive. Not dead. Not some death isn't out. They're not getting out that easy. Their torment's going to begin here and it will continue. Why? Because in the truth of all the all of what God has given them, they chose against Christ. And believe it or not, the ones who reject, those are the ones who have more knowledge than you do. They do. They have deep secrets. They know they have no excuse. In the Bible, there's a passage that says those people, right, who reject them, they were given more than you are. They were given proof, and they still didn't believe. For example, a person in the government who knows many mysteries, right, they know certain things. And they refuse to accept the Lamb of God. They refuse to accept the sacrifice. There are ancient things on this earth. That's not going to be a mystery long. And you will not like the day when it's no longer a mystery. But I can tell you something. A euphoria comes with it. Don't be fooled by niceness. There's a whole race that is beautiful and nice. And they are the doom of humanity. They are without question beautiful, both male and female. They are nice and accommodating, well-spoken, seemingly spiritually mature, very intellectually accommodating and smart, and they're going to be the doom of humanity. You know people in your lives that are just like that. But every time you try to bring up the Lord, they go right back to the world with their secular things. They fight against the spirit with the known weapons of the world. Haven't you noticed that? Pay attention next time. But if, if you ever go to your secret place and you pray, and you come out of that place of prayer... They're going to get you involved in some secular thing to take down that power that's over you, a prayer, to make you sit right back down and relinquish your position. They'll do it hardly so that the spirit is not so strong on you. They'll cut a joke. They'll start talking about some raunchy subject or something to get you back in the flesh. Many of you will find out these people are assigned to you. Some of you already know they're assigned to you somehow, and you can't get rid of them. You don't want to get rid of them, but you need to get rid of them. That's in your heart right now. It's in your mind right now. I, I know I shouldn't be around this person, but I like this person. I, what do I do? I'm stuck. No, you're not stuck. You're going to have to make it. A, see, it's going to be painfully obvious one day. You don't want to be bold with the Lord around them either because you really can't afford to lose them. Your predicament is known. So let me tell you this. How long? How long? Because if you're thinking the world's going to start ending and that's going to be your out, this it's not going to happen that way. To the very end, they're going to be assigned to you. It's a very easy solution. You know what that is? The first step is you being real with the Lord. If you love him, then stop shying away from it. Second is this. What do you truly believe? Because if you believe in Christ, right? Then you're a citizen of his kingdom. Right? And that means you'll uphold everything of his kingdom. But you cannot partake of this earthly stuff anymore. Some of you, the only reason you put up with secular things is because of that person. What you're doing is allowing that assignment to get to you. That's what you're doing. They've won you over. They have, that, that's how things attach themselves to you. Not in some alien way. Doesn't take that. Nope. No, they attach you in other ways. 
They try to get a commitment from you, so you'll be stuck bound by your own words. Once you make your position known, you'll notice something. One of two things will happen. Once you start to be real with the Messiah and stand up in your true faith, that thing that's utilizing them will have to either go or that person's going to show their true colors. Lord have mercy. Some of you out there, you already know there's a, there's a problem concerning trust. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't even trust the person. The Lord has been warning you. You're not acting on it. You're trying to overlook it. And you're partaking in something that's taken away from you. Haven't you noticed the more you partake, the more ailments you have? How much more does God have to do? He's showing something so clearly to many of you. You have issues you've never, you never thought you'd have. You're not even supposed to have those issues, but you're inviting them into your life. And it's causing decay in your life simply because you're not standing up by way of truth. You've got to make your stance so it's not too late. Somebody has to appeal to you before everything is lost. Your Lord does not want to lose anything about you. But you've got to stand up in truth, not falsehoods. You can't toggle back and forward. That's killing you. Stand where you stand. But don't you dictate the outcome. The outcome belongs to the Most High. Don't you dictate the outcome. Don't even think about the outcome. Stop trying to make the outcome your way. Stand in truth. It's as simple as that. Stand in truth. And you'll see what you need to see. But authenticate your relationship with Christ. Don't put your relationship with Christ on the line because you know in your heart of hearts the Lord to you is everything. You're just in a dilemma right now, compromise right now. You'd rather die than lose Christ. It's time for you to choose. Let me take a break and I'll be back in just a second right here at COT. Okay, all right, back to Revelation. I don't know how we got in that subject. You know, sometimes, 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 folks. Sometimes. Where were we? Okay. All right, you all. We were in, reading in, Revelation 19, right? We're in Revelation 19, you all. I totally got off topic, off the subject. Off of, no, no, we were, we were way back. I'm sorry. Revelation uh, 16. 16, you guys ready? You guys ready for this? Let's look at how real these issues are going to be. You know what? I want to, I want to say something. We're going to read about the seven bowls of God's wrath, right? Seven bowls of God's wrath. Now listen to me. I want you guys to take a look at what the earth is like during these seven bowls. And ask yourself something. How long would it really take from right now to that time for the earth to change, for conditions to change, to be just like that. Right? I know mankind is, is uh, you know, going to add to the moon. I'm just sorry if you don't believe they went there, but, but they're going to add to the moon. China will too. Everybody will too. There's going to be fights on there. They're going to try. They're going to get to Mars. I suspect they're going to get to Mars, and it only takes less than, well, it won't take long at all. Because they have things built for that already. They have the private sector involved and lots of money has gone out. They will attempt it. I think that anybody who goes out there uh, is going to have a hard time explaining uh, if they ever get back. Right? Right? 
Somebody says, stop, don't talk about your husbands. No, remember the scriptures, married ones. You ready? You don't bail on your, you know, your husbands or something like that. Listen to me. You have an opportunity. Do you not know that God sees you as one flesh? One, not two, one. One flesh. And when you're one flesh, guess what happens when one half is all messed up? The other half becomes a covering. Do you know that? It is by your covering that other person is covered. You cannot compare your relationship with anybody else's. Don't do that. Don't do that. You have to learn that you're one flesh. Let your commitment be real. You want the Lord involved? And be committed. In a lot of cases, the problem is not that the other person is possessed by a devil. The problem is you're not committed. The problem is you're trying to come up with a backup plan. Listen to me. When you're committed, do you not know that the believing spirit is the dominant, dominating spirit in there. That doesn't mean you tell the other person what to do. That doesn't mean you take the Bible and shove it down your spouse's mouth. That's not what that means. Let your spouse be your spouse. You be a representative of the kingdom and love your spouse with, without condition. You've got to look at your spouse again and say, I'm committed. Period. You've got to walk in forgiveness on a daily basis. You've got to find a balance. And love the Lord with all of what you are. But because you're married, you better also love your other half. Nobody goes around hating the right side of their body. Nobody walks around saying, how can I get away from the left side of my body? Right? You don't do that. You don't do that. Don't do that. No. You know everything your other half is doing, and if you don't, just simply look. And when you see something that's not lining up, you pray. You pray peace. You pray forgiveness. You stay committed. And you acknowledge, Lord, you see us as one flesh. We need your intervention. Always have God at the head of your family. Not just you two and everybody else is out the window, no. Be one flesh, and Yahshua is your Lord and Savior. There is nothing your Lord and Savior cannot do, do you hear me? The problem is the believer is thinking of escape. You don't have to escape. You're not trapped. You need intervention by the Messiah, not by some formula, not by some self-help book. And it begins with your commitment. If you really love your other half, if you really love the Lord, then be committed. Be committed. That you don't, that the bossiness, the I'm rightness and all this, that, oop, throw that out the window. And if you're a female, you don't yet understand that you're the backbone. You know what happened to the strongest person on earth if their backbone fell out? They couldn't do anything. You know what happens to a male? Males, you can, you can let me know if I'm wrong. But if a female ever tells a male, you're doing a good job, well, that male will stand up twice as high, twice as strong, hmm? and try everything. Somebody says, Mike, you say God did not put us all together. I said people get together by lust. But who reconciliates the world? Yahshua HaMashiach. Our Father did that through Yahshua. Is he not your Lord and Savior? Or is he your Savior or what? Is he your Lord? Huh? Is he your King of kings and Lord of lords? Because if he is, and you have access to that throne, then stop sitting in your chair. Stop thinking up a thousand reasons to run away and get Yahshua involved. He will not go against your will. Have you noticed that? If you have a will, he's not going to go against it. Stop trying to bury your spouses early. How about that one? Stop looking at somebody else. Stop thinking somehow it's gonna, it will be easier with somebody else. 
No. No. Your one flesh, God sees you as one flesh, not two flesh. Not two, one. When he looks at you, he sees both. If you're running away, he's going to see you not covering the other half. How's that look? How's that look? When you get married in an era where there's no commitment, but you do love your spouse, then go to the Lord immediately and acknowledge that. Don't keep it a secret. Don't assume it's going to be all right. Acknowledge that. The Lord will open doors you never thought existed. Listen to me. You want to do God's will or your own will? What do you want to do? You want the Lord's outcome or yours? Because you don't have time to play games anymore. You don't have time for formulas. You don't have time for attitude and all those things. Nope. You want healing. You want correction. You want salvation. You want the embrace and completion. If I started eating everything I could see, right? Do you really think the Lord's going to bless my body? You think I'm going to stay upright? Or will I end up six feet under? I'll tell you right now, if I abuse what the Lord has made me a steward over, I can forget it. I'm telling you about health. If I know how to feed this body, but I neglect that, I'm going to pay the price. Because the Lord requires stewardship of all of us. Stewardship. You know what that means? Whatever he gives you, you take care of. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Somebody says, what if it's not your first marriage? Huh? Why do we act like we're virgins? Why do we act like we never sinned in our lives? The Lord forgives sin. A sin is a sin. And only Yahshua by his blood. Can that be corrected? With instruction from the Most High. That's what you need. You don't need my opinion in that. You need God's intervention. He is the only one that can take something stinky and make it smell good, right? He made me smell good. Well, that is, if I'm not running a long distance and my right guard does not turn left. But I smell good. But the Lord did that. Is there a limitation on what he can overturn? No. Is there a limitation on what he can forgive? No. He forgives the unforgivable. And don't bring up the blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Because we know in every single case, everybody who blasphemed the Holy Spirit gave up the ghost. They gave up the ghost. God didn't strike them down. They gave up the ghost. The guilt was so heavy, they just gave up the ghost and left their flesh. So that's out the window. You're still here. You still believe in Christ. Stand upright in the Lord. Start walking forward. Don't put limitations on the Most High. Don't do that. Stop listening to everybody and go boldly to the throne of grace to find help in a time of need. See, where people say it's hopeless, don't the Lord provide hope? When Lazarus was dead, nobody recovers from that. Oh, yes, they do. Death is the ultimate thing nobody recovers from. And what did Jesus do? Huh? A lot of people say, yep, he took what was dead and made it alive. I'm going to tell you something. He took that impossible situation with a barrier nobody can ever cross. And he put life into it again. He gave it life. You know what it takes to give something life? The breath of life. So he is able to breathe life into whatever he breathes life into. He is given that authority by the Father. All things were given to the Son. And the Son just so happens to be your Savior. Mm -hmm. my goodness somebody says Mike if one is committed adultery not to remarry according to Jesus which I have what what are you talking what, what, did, are you Jewish let me ask you guys something I'm going to ask you something can I ask you guys something I'm going to ask you guys something what are you? What are you? By birth, what are you? What are you guys by birth? Hmm? You're Jew or Gentile? By birth. 
Don't say a Jew unless you're from Israel and of the Jewish line. You're a Gentile, bought up in America, many of you, bought up in Germany, many of you, different ways, right? You commit adultery, right? Then you go get married again, you think you're living in sin or something like that. Correct? Let me tell you something. If, if any knew the truth about what sin was, not one of us would have committed sin. The truth is we did not know what sin was. Right now, we have no realization of many sins. Because if we did, there's no way we could ever commit a sin. Hmm? Somebody said, remarried Mike after committing adultery. Well, let's look at that. How many of you married somebody and you were a virgin? Don't answer that. But the, the answer is slim to none. People don't get married when they're virgins these days. See, we've got to stop living in this illusionary world where people think they're just, I don't know what they're thinking. I, I don't know what they're thinking. But most people just, they assume, you know, that they're virgins. I'm telling you right now, most people are not. They're not. They're not. And we know that, don't we? We know, we know that without Christ, we're not going to make it. We already know that. Without Christ, we're not going to make it. How many of you cursed somebody else? What is worse, adultery or cursing somebody? I'll tell you right now that murder is at the top of the list. God has already given us what he hates, and we all did it. We did it through downing somebody else. If you ever spoke to somebody and discouraged them, you know what happens when you laugh at somebody? You kill their future. How do I know that? Somebody laughed at me one time when I was little. And you know what it did? It discouraged me from ever going in that specific direction. They killed an entire future for me. They did. Do you know I laughed at somebody else? And I could feel the destruction inside. And I was only 11 years old. I was only 11. Still murder. If you hate someone, it's murder. Murder. Now, how many people have we really murdered? See, the truth is, without Christ, we're done for. We're done for. We don't deserve any goodness. We deserve death everlasting. But the Lord loves us enough where he said, no, I'm going to excuse everything they did. If they choose to be children of the kingdom, and indeed they follow me, I'm going to excuse everything they did. See, some of us, when we really learned about Christ, we did cry. Do you know why? Because we knew what we did. We were honest with ourselves. And we knew we were thieving, adulterous murderers. And we knew there was no way back from that. That we had gone against the Father. We broke all the commandments. And when we heard about Christ... We couldn't believe it. See, we had heard about Christ many days, many years. But there was that one time when we heard. We heard. Hmm? We heard. And when we heard, we did what? I cried because I said, there's no way somebody died for me, but they did. And I said, I'll accept it. I'll do more than accept it. I'll honor him. And I've been trying my hardest to honor the Lord ever since. Do you know that? Ever since. And I'll continue to do it. Because you know, in truth, there's no way I can do anything for Christ that would ever match what he did for me. And nobody in their right mind would ever do something like that for me. Nobody. Nobody. But he did. Not only did he, but even the father would not let him turn back on that. How loving of a father do we really have? Hmm? So how many of you think that the blood of the lamb is not able to forgive sins? Because I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I believe that if you believe in Christ, regardless of what you have done in this world, I believe that the Lord can forgive all things. That's what I believe. I believe the power of that sacrifice is the most powerful thing we can have in our lives. That's what I believe. 
That's what I believe. So I don't, I don't go for the hypotheticals. I don't live my life by hypotheticals. I live my life by faith, not by sight. I don't, I don't pull Charlie Browns. I don't do the woe is me thing. I'm very thankful. There is no pity in me. I'm thankful. I don't come up with a thousand excuses trying to get from man. See, you people asking me, can you be forgiven of this? I'm not the Messiah. I didn't give my life for you. You're asking the wrong person. The Lord was clear about what he could forgive. See, now, now I love you. This is why I'm going to say this. You're bringing up the questions of why you can't be forgiven because you fail to read what he did forgive. It's time for you to accept what he forgave and stop living in condemnation. There is no condemnation to them that believe in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but those who walk in the spirit. So follow him. Stop following everybody else. Stop following doctrine. Stop flip-flopping and looking for everything. Follow Christ. You know, there's proof of that. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You know what that means? You're in bondage. Only if you do not partake of the spirit of the Lord. There is no bondage with the spirit of the Lord. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. If you don't have that liberty, simply face Christ. Understand what he did. And walk in faith. If, if the Lord did not love you, if he weren't going to forgive you, you could not believe in him. Do you know that? There's no way you could believe. He is the son of the living God, and you would not believe in his gospel. Now, let me tell all of you something. You can hear a person talk about Jesus all day. They can clap, jump, do everything else. If they do not agree with his gospel, they are none of his. Remember that. If they do not believe in his gospel, they are none of his. They're none of his. The only way to believe in Christ is to believe in his gospel. If you don't believe in his gospel, you're none of his. That's when you go back to the drawing board and say, wait a minute, do I believe in his gospel? Or have I read too many self-help books? Have I read too many things from other people and not read the word? You've got to go back to the word of God and see if you agree with his gospel. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See if you agree with it. Time for you to be persistent. If you're going to follow him, then follow him and move everybody else out of the way. It's time to follow Christ. Don't play with your salvation. Don't do it. Don't do it. See, somebody says the gospel has rules. Hmm. You need to go back and read it for you and for salvation's cause and ask yourself do you believe because right now you got somebody else's you got a few voices in your head time for you to stand up and fight those voices i say that out of love that's out of love you need to fight what's fighting you and you do that by going back to the word of god don't echo words that somebody else put in your head to anybody else nope no, clear your mind by following Christ and go back to the word of God. I got something else. Somebody says the gospel has rules. No, it does not. All of it's by invitation. You either accept it or you do not. If you accept it, it is a lifestyle, no rules. There are no rules in there. There are no, you can't do this and can't do that. No, it isn't. It has nothing to do with that. It is to love your neighbor as you love yourself and love the Lord your God with all of what you are. That's not a rule. That's not a rule. That's a recognition. That's what that is. That is recognition of something you need to find. When you have it, you will have found it. And you'll never say the gospel has rules again. Hmm? See, because when you see Christ, there is no rule. There's only love. There's no rule. There's only love. And in love, there's no rule for kindness. 
It's what you want to do. It's a desire to be kind. That's what love is. There is a desire to be kind. There's no rule. See, the world will say, well, that's a rule. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. That's a characteristic, part of your desires. That's a desire to do right. It's a desire to be upright. It's a desire to do those things. There's no rule. No rule. Find Christ. Find him for real. While well, you can. That's something you have to, nobody can do that for you. That's something you have to go and look for. Nobody can find him for you. They can only point the way. Hmm? The rest is up to you, as it is to all of us. Okay, folks. We're going to go through these plagues real quick. I know it's 816, and I'm getting close to the time where I have to skedaddle. Here we go. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying unto the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of wrath upon the earth. And the first went, poured out his vial upon the earth, to full of noise and grease them sore upon men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them that worshipped his image. We read these last night, but hold on. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, which was, and which shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. And thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. We talked about that last night. If you missed it, you have to go listen to it. If you missed that, go listen to it. Because this is an identification of a place that has become worldwide. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And blasphemed the name of God, which had the power over these plains. And they repented not to give him glory. I want to pause right there real quick. Look at the condition of the people that are left on the earth. So the fourth angel pours out his vial upon the sun. Power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched or burnt with great heat. Look what they did when they were burnt. They blasphemed the name of God. So what is that? They identified where it was coming from. Now, in order to blaspheme God, dishonor him, in order to do that, you have to be one of those who once knew him. Right? Stay with me. You have to know him to blaspheme. You can blaspheme nothing you don't know. Do you know that? They knew him. Keep in mind, before this ever happens, there's a falling away. The revealing of the beast, remember that. So if many fall away from what? From the faith. That means that once, they, weren't, they were right here in COT, but they fell away. They fell away, right? They fell away. They were, they were in a church somewhere. They fell away. They were listening or reading the gospel, but they fell away. And they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they were, listen, they repented not to give him glory. They would not thank him for what he did. So, so let me give you this idea. Imagine a person who gives God no thanks, but is always looking for extra. They have no thanks in their lives for what's, what God has done. They cannot recognize what God has done. They will give him no thanks. Listen to me. They will only talk about shortcomings. You know how many people like that are out there? And God said what he would do with this. And I'm giving you a good description because these people are out there right now. They will not thank him. They won't thank him. They won't. They won't give him glory. They will not recognize the marvelous things he is, they can't identify him in their lives. They won't do it. Why, though? Why? Come on now, everybody, why? Why? Why would a person not give God thanks if they know who he is? Why would a person not give God thanks if they know what he did? Why? This brings up something. 
that I'm going to talk about. This will be the last subject I'll talk about tonight. Somebody said they murmur and complain and get angry because they aren't good. That's, that's, that's very close. Here it is. You ready? When people know about the living God, they read about him and everything else. There's a certain type of person. And they say in their heads, well, if I do everything required of me, God will fix so-and-so. And it seems like that is faith, and that is not faith. That's not faith. Let me continue this. So, they're looking in the word of God. They're trying to do everything required. But only so God can do something for them. They're looking for that one thing. And they search feverishly in the word of God to find what the proper things are. Because they're trying to get something out of God. They came to Christ because he was their answer. And they thought it in their heads that, hey, if I serve the Lord, this Bible says the Lord will do so and so. So I'm going to give it my all so I can get this. And every day it does not come, their heart gets worse and worse. Until finally, they have not received what they wanted from God. And they refuse to give him glory. That's how it begins. They refuse because they'll say, well, I'm not getting anything. And I've done everything and I didn't get, I didn't get what I wanted. And eventually they say, I'm out. I'm done with this. It ends up that way because they made a deal. See, that's not based on love. That means you're willing to do whatever it takes to get what you want. That's what it means. Do you know that, in part, many of us were attracted to Christ because we all had a need of something? We did. Something was broken. Something wasn't going right. But then something changed. Listen to me. Here's how the Lord works. Something changed. You may have begun that way. But you did not continue that way because when the truth was given to you, you saw Christ and he showed you your sin. And at that moment, you forgot about what you needed from the Lord. And you said, I'm a wretch. I'm the lowest person on the earth is what you said when you saw your own sin. The Lord will show you exactly who you are. And in that moment, you know you are distant from the Messiah, from all things of God. At that point, you know you blew it, but, but, but worse than that, you know you deserve hell itself. And with that heaviness and that realization, it is a heavy realization. The Messiah shines so bright, doesn't it? The unbelievable thing before you is the Messiah and what he's doing. And there's no way for you to stop it. That's what happens in that moment of clarity. You understand the cross because you understand exactly who you are. In my case, you know what I said? With tears, I said, I'm not worth it. Don't die for me. That's what I said. Don't die for me. With tears, I said that. Not me. Not me. When that moment of clarity came, that's precisely when I said, not me. Not me. And that was in my heart. And then before I knew it, I understood what he did. And in that very same moment, all this is in the same moment, in that same moment, it was as if, it was as if I came right out of my skin. Like I didn't have a body. Like I had no weights. Like I knew at that point 
At that moment, I had a savior who did the unbelievable. And the tears came again, but with determination. And in my heart, not with my mouth, the only thing that came in my heart was, I will honor you above all I know, above all I'll ever know. And then a freedom came. And that's when, that's when the kingdom became clear. And like an epiphany struck me with lightning, I looked around and I said, oh, anybody can come here. Everybody can come here. There's room for everybody. And then I was driven. Driven to go and tell anybody who would hear. That there's room in a kingdom. That is not tainted. Not polluted. There's room for everybody. So in that case, I don't care about opposition. Of course, you can tell that. I don't. Because there's room in the kingdom for everybody. Everybody. And there's a Messiah who is a real Messiah. Who has been empowered over all of it. And there's no way we can ever comprehend. His love towards us. There's no way we can ever comprehend what he truly did. See now, when you have that moment of clarity, all that comes. You can't help but to be thankful for all of what the Lord did. See, for me in my life, this is the truth. I said this on day one in 1984. I'll say it now. If I did not enter into the kingdom of God, if God told me, Mike, stop right there, you can't come in, I would only ask him, can I see others go in? And I'm telling you right now with all my heart, that would suffice me for an eternity. I don't have to enter in. Just to know somebody made it in there. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. That's why I have no complaints. That's why I'm not looking for anything. I'm not doing this for some reward. What the Lord did, he already did. He did everything already. He did not do another thing for me because he did everything already. And it's my honor, my privilege to do anything good for the kingdom. There are those who have gone through that experience. Sadly, there are some who discount it all because they did not get what they wanted. See, you may start out because you were in trouble, but what I'm telling you is when you're called for real, when you have that real moment, you don't want anything. You don't want anything. Some people get stuck. Because that moment has not come for them yet. See, that moment comes based on God's appointed time, not man's appointed time. You may not have gone through that moment yet, but it's coming. I'm talking about a moment of realization that nobody can really describe. There are no words to really describe that. And when that day comes... That's when your heart has no complaints. That's when you have no shortcomings. But the Lord sets that up. He does that, not us. We can't appoint the time. I couldn't appoint the time. You can't appoint the He appoints the time. And that's a moment of clarity. It does age, does not matter. I'm telling you that something real takes place for the most time. And there is a notable difference of the person, always, not sometimes, always. Now, 
Now listen to me. When a person is sincere about Jesus, when you see your own life and what you truly are, and you're no longer listening to Satan. See, when you get tired and start recognizing evil for what evil is, you're ready. When you stop denying yourself, you're ready. When you see the Lord and he becomes your desire, you're ready. When a person has a desire for Christ, They'll accept no substitutions. They don't. And did you notice the biggest thing? You became a child again right before that moment. Come on, somebody. That means in that moment, you didn't know anything. You came to the realization you didn't know anything. Don't you remember that moment? When all your knowledge and all your wisdom went right out the window and you said, Lord, let me quit. Let me stop. Lord, I need you. Because, you know what, I was thinking, I was thinking in that moment, I was thinking, you know what? All of my total, sum total of wisdom is stupid. I can't make, I, I, I don't know, heads or tails of even those things I do know. I'm spinning my wheels. And it felt like the world was no longer real to me. It did. It felt like everything in the world was a lost cause. And everything, all the knowledge that I had was worthless. Everything became worthless. And the only thing that mattered to me in that moment was knowing God for real, was knowing the Messiah for real. You know what's funny, though? When I was young, young, the Lord touched me. I used to have dreams all the time when I was 9, 10. I, people would say they're prophetic dreams. But later on in life, that time came for me. It didn't happen when I was young, when all the other stuff was happening. It did not happen when I went to the altar. No. It happened when I was by myself, doing my thing, and wham, the whole moment came. And it consumed the whole night. That's when it came. But I remember in that moment, I looked at the world and I was thinking in my mind, Lord, this is not what I'm looking for. I wanted something from the Messiah because I no longer accepted what anybody was presenting to me. I started to see through the world so quickly. And I said, this isn't it. This is not it. When we stop excusing ourselves, When we stop saying, woe is me, when we cut all that out, that moment comes. See, because your encounter with a Messiah telling you this, you'll never have a pity party again. You won't. Not when you have that encounter, you won't. And it's coming for everybody that believes in Jesus of Nazareth. Because ultimately, ultimately, you're going to see exactly who you are. Ultimately, all the disguise comes down. Ultimately, every wall is going to crumble. And the Lord will do exactly what he said he would do. He knows when you're ready. So pursue him. So what happens to those who don't get what they want? Right? Let's read about them real quick. I know I said that was the last thing I was going to read. i got to read this one more thing. Then, then that's really the last thing I'm going to read because I'm going to be late. And COT is getting a, we're getting our thing. we got to transfer something tonight. So we need to get this. But, you know, everybody has read 
in the Bible. They've read Thessalonians, right? Everybody has read Thessalonians. But in Thessalonians, that familiar scripture, the Lord, the Lord had given Paul the reason for what he did. He did. He gave him the reason. In fact, he gave us a whole thing, right? He did. He gave us a whole thing. Listen to this. Listen to this. First, he said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except they come and falling away first. Well, that's underway, evidently. Right? Then he said, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worshipped. Right? Now, this thing that will exalt itself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as God, I believe that's a dual role. Here's what I mean. He'll be inside people and he'll be inside a place. I can already see him. I can already see that spirit settling within people. This spirit exalts itself above everything that is called God. Now, if something exalts itself above God, it'll do just like Lucifer did. It'll question everything God did. Don't you think? That's exactly what Lucifer does. That's why we began this conversation the way it did, obviously. This same spirit is going to sit in the temple of God. You know, the Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? It's going to sit in the hearts of men where it ought not be. And it will challenge everything about God. Listen to this. So that he has God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And again, I have to remind you, the same person that said this, also said that, know you not that you are the temple of God. Hmm. Listen, it says, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now you know what's being hidden that he might be revealed in his time. It's being held back. So that when a specific time comes, that thing is going to go to work. But you can already see it sitting where it should not be in people exalting itself above God. Every time God does something notable, it is both spiritual and physical. Both, it is both, not one or the other, it's both. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only now he who liveth will let tell it be taken out of the way. Listen, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power uh, uh, and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. So guess what? Only in those who will perish will something actually sit in them and exalt itself above the living God. That's already coming by way of conversation. When people talk against the living God. How do you talk against God? By speaking against his gospel. Who was the gospel given by Jesus, who was the word of God made flesh? Let's continue. It says, for this cause. Uh-oh. Well, well, let me go back. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Uh oh, there it is. They did not receive the love of the truth. Not the mandate of the truth. You know what the love of the truth is? The love of the truth is what Jesus did for us. That God loved us enough to send his only word, his only begotten son, his word, the word that condemned us. He had that nailed to a cross. He killed his own word and resurrected a new one for us. That's L-O-V-E. Then he appointed a king and savior over us. Now those who receive that love, they recognize themselves for who they really are. They see that act of love. They see the cross as the greatest act of love they could ever see in life. And they will not reject it, nor dethrone it, nor say it has no power. They won't say that. Why? 
because they received it. Listen to me. Listen. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion. Why? Why would he send them a strong delusion? Let me read it one more time. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. It did not say they didn't receive the truth. It said they did not receive the love of the truth. Why is that important? If you get the truth, you have the truth, right? But if you receive the love of the truth, you know what the act is. And when you know what the act is, that's when you respond. If you disconnect that act of love, from what happened, you just have knowledge. Knowledge is nothing if you have no idea how to apply it. But when you see the act of love in the act, you're not going to stay the same. You're not. When you receive that for yourselves, your father intervenes. He will do something to you, and that's how you'll not be the same. Let me continue. So, those, listen, those that did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, what does the Lord say? Here it is. This is when, you can't skip over this. Those who did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved for that cause, because of those people. God shall send them a strong delusion. Who's going to send them a strong delusion? Is it Satan? No. God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Satan doesn't send it. God sends it. I'm going to emphasize that one more time in your hearing. And for this cause, this is second, this is um, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. 11 and 12. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. God shall send them strong delusion. God shall send them strong delusion. Who? God. Not Satan. God will send them a strong delusion. For what reason? That they should believe a lie. He's doing this so they will believe a lie. He's doing this so they will believe that delusional thing. And why? Because after they believe them, what? For what reason, Lord? Huh? That they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You think that's cruel? No, it isn't. Because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And see, that fights against the love of God. Pleasure in unrighteousness. That's why my pleasure be in the most high. Because there is none righteous, no, not one. My pleasure, it truly is, in this word. It truly is. That's hard for people to understand, so be it. But it's in this word. Because this word, this word, is the physician's word. The word of the physician that can really set you free all the way. And nothing else will do that. But do you guys hear that? So it's not the devil sending anything. It is God sending a strong delusion. That they would believe a lie. Who? Those who had pleasure in unrighteousness. Huh? Those are the ones. Those who received not the love of the truth. They did not receive the love of the truth. Do they have the truth? Yep. So does a computer. So does a library. So does somebody who remember this, remembers those scriptures. They have the truth, but they don't have the love of the truth. They know the act. They know when it happened. They can extract details, but they do not have the love of the truth. Because when you have the love of that truth, Everything is different then. People saw Jesus on the cross. They knew what happened. They didn't have the love of the truth. They spent their time scrutinizing what they saw. They challenged what they saw. 
Then they try to exterminate what they saw. When you have the love of the truth, that's when you receive the act upon yourselves. When you embrace it, it's real. Do you know in this day and age, something is sitting within the hearts of mankind, rejecting and challenging everything in this book? And what do you think that is? Hmm? What do you think it is? It's going to happen just like that. See, most people read that, and they extract a few things. I hope that you guys heard the whole thing. I hope that you now know that God will send a strong delusion, not the devil. God will. He's going to seal the deal. Nobody escapes anything. Because let me tell you something. What type of a heart does somebody have to have to reject the cross in truth? Have you guys ever did something good for someone? And you did it with your last... And it meant everything to you. And so you did that as a gift to somebody else. For them to turn and discount the value of what you gave. Anybody ever do that? Hmm? You gave somebody a gift. And they essentially spit on it. So you know what it is to give your all to somebody who would reject it. You also know, if God gives his best, that's life-altering. And it's nothing in comparison to anything we're able to do. God laid everything out. He did. Right there in the New Testament. He laid everything out. No tricks, no anything. He laid it out. And he already told us through Paul why people do not receive the love of the truth. You know why? Because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. So God shall send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you'll always end up being a murderer. Do you know that? Always. Plot that out on a piece of paper. Run the scenarios and tell me I'm wrong. You'll always end up being a murderer. Always. When you love unrighteousness, that's when you're kaput because you will not love the Lord. You cannot love both. You're going to love one and despise the other. Cling to one and reject the other, but you will not love both. You cannot have a love of the truth. And have pleasure in unrighteousness. Because the love of the truth is going to get in the way of all unrighteousness. It will annoy you that you cannot have pleasure in unrighteousness. All of you know that because you tried it. You tried to go back to that old thing. And there was no joy in it. Only a stain. You tried it. You already know. Better thank God for it too. That's why you had no pleasure in it. Because it was totally different, wasn't it? Hmm? You had no pleasure in it. Instead of holding your head down, say, thank you, Lord, you showed me that one. You showed me that one. That's why you shouldn't be a denier of what you used to be. Have an understanding of the old man and thank God 
but he has appointed you to something brand new. A new way, a new destination, a new standard, a new spirit. Because if you don't have that born-again spirit, yet you will. You will not leave this earth without that born-again spirit, which means some of you are having a hard time getting over certain desires. You see, you can't break free of this, that, or the other. Let me share something with you. When you have that born-again spirit, guess what happens? You'll only have a desire for righteousness, and nothing of flesh will hold you back again. God will determine when that born-again spirit comes. He'll do it. What our Father does, he does for real. It's not some show. It's not for, you know, it's not for kudo points. Nope, it's for real. We're talking about salvation. Real salvation. Not that phony baloney junk. Real salvation. These plagues uncover quite a bit, don't they? They connect to quite a bit. They give us the attitude of the people who undergo them. They show us who's left on the earth. And it leads back to other passages that show us what these people are really like and how they got that way. We have a lot more to cover, yes. Oh, we have a lot more to cover. And it will open up quite a bit. And I hope that somehow you guys benefit from these conversations. This vial poured upon the sun sounds cruel. It sounds cruel until you realize who's involved and who it's pouring out on. This is what no one will escape who ends up on that side. And all of you determine that now, today. None of us are promised tomorrow. None of us are. But I'll tell you something. In these days, the Lord is doing a quick work. I mean a quick work. He is turning the impossible around. My, I'm going to advise that all of you is pursue him. Pursue him. Do it in truth. Be real about it. Because he certainly is being real about you. I'm going to join you all tomorrow right here at COT. I'm going to say God bless each of you. We're moving some info tonight, and that's a very difficult job for a database. Anything could go wrong, so we're moving that. If the site happens to go down a little bit, it's because we're moving data, okay? It'll only freeze for about a couple minutes. The chat rooms will stay operational. They're not going to freeze at all. We're doing a workaround on that, okay? But listen, listen, we're going to go, we're, we're going full, full ahead. I've taken all certain restraints in our direction with COT. All right. If it, if, listen to me carefully. Just listen. Now, our last talk, I did not mean for anybody to use PayPal. I did not. But I was thinking about something, and I did pray about something. We're going to go forward. If it works, then thank God. If it does not work, well, then it doesn't work. It, which means if, it, if, it, if things get into a crunch, well, then that's the way it is. But I will have you guys up to speed on what we're doing. That's something I did not do. I'm going to keep you guys up to speed, okay? So you know exactly where we are and what we're doing. Now, keep in mind, the enemy is always in the camp, all right? Always in the camp, right? So you got to expect by your hearing some opposition that will throw things off. Remember that. They're always, listen, every time, this, this, this is no joke. This goes with any organization, anything you attempt to do. God knows I'm telling the truth. If COT is in need, 
then I'm telling you it's going to be a group of people who will have a need also, who will cry that need out, but I won't say a word. Just remember that. That's the way the enemy works. That's why it's good to be responsive by way of your spirit in truth so that you're never fooled. Are they people that will fool you? You better believe it. You better believe it. All right? So just be just be straight with the spirit. That's all. Be straight with the spirit. Listen, I appreciate all of what you guys do. I do. I appreciate it. I do. I really do. And things will, you know, they'll be as God determines. I pray that we continue, but that's up to our Father. That really is. That's up to him. But you guys are excellent. You really are. So we're going to go forward and what we have to do. And we'll go as far as we can go if that continues for five more years and so be it. So be it. But the Lord will have his way regardless. He will. With that, I'm going to say God bless you. This is you guys. Revelation is going to get complicated opening up. <laughs> it will. It's going to be controversial. I'm sure that some people have not heard certain things like we're going to cover uh, in this. But the Lord is quite serious about your salvation. And you know what the greatest thing is? He does not want to lose any of you. Do you know that? He didn't want not one of you condemned. He didn't want anybody condemned. He does not. That's why we're given so much time. Be true spiritually. Be true to yourselves. Follow Christ. Do that in earnest. Not to get something. Recognize what he has already given to us. Because what he has given to us is invaluable. It really is. You guys take care of one another. Take care of those appointed places the Lord has placed you in too. Do not neglect them. Satan is fighting. And he just loves it. When, when opposition comes. It's up to you not to let him win. That is totally up to you. In the Bible, the people were always...